Hi, this is Brother Richard. And today we're continuing with our series, Prototokos Mystery. And this will be part 335. We're continuing with our lesson title, Prototokos Advent. This will be part 5. We're talking about three parts, three groups that comprise what the scripture calls the church of the firstborn, the assembly of the firstborn ones, the church of the brethren. We talked about two of these groups, one called the elder group, the other called the priest angel group. And today we want to discuss the third group called the bride. Scripture teaches the most glorious position to ever be achieved will be that of the bride of Christ. This group of saints will be brought forth just before the return of the Lord to set up God's kingdom upon earth. Turn to Revelation 19, verses 6 to 8. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So what we find here, the scripture is giving us an understanding of the timing and of the composition of this group, this unique group. We find two things. In verse 8, we read, To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So it's speaking about the glory that this group will manifest. In verse 7, we read, Let us be glad. Pardon me. I feel the sneeze coming on there momentarily. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. The word ready there basically comes from a Greek term hitomazo which means prepared. She becomes a bride, the bride because she has prepared herself to be the bride. Unlike the other groups, the inference is there is a choice being made in her entering into this exclusive group. The other two, the elders, the angel priests are called by the father for the positions that they occupy. Now what we find unique about the bride position is that she prepares herself, she makes herself ready, not in heaven when she becomes a bride, but in her life on earth when she decides to become a disciple. Turn to Matthew, the ninth chapter, verses 14 to 15. Matthew 9, Verses 14 to 15. 
<clears throat> Verse 14, Then came to him, Jesus, the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not? So we see three groups of disciples. The disciples of the learner and the follower. The disciples of John, the disciples of the Pharisees, and the disciples of Christ. Note how the Lord responds to this question. Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? For the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, then shall they fast. He does not refer to them as disciples. He refers to them as the children of the bride chamber. Now this word bride chamber in the, in the Greek is nymphon, which means the place where the bride prepares. So what's being said here is his disciples have reached the first stage. They become disciples. There are two groups of Christians, believers and disciples. A believer is a person who's born again because he believes in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, effectively cleansing him from sin. The disciple goes beyond that to determine that not only is his life changed, he's born again, he's cleansed from sin, but he wants to live the life of Christ. He wants to be a learner and a follower of Jesus Christ. It speaks of commitment. Now, in that respect, what we find is the Lord is saying here that the disciples are all considered candidates to become the bride. He calls them the children of the bride chamber. Having said that, we take it to the next step. To become the bride, therefore, is a decision that the individual makes concerning his commitment to Jesus Christ. And there are certain characteristics that the Lord points out that pertain to that individual who is potentially a bride member and gone beyond the stage of discipleship. Scripture teaches the bride member will develop a love for the bridegroom that will resonate, cause a response in his life with the father and the son. In other words, the father and the son will take note of the disciple's heart as it pertains to his relationship with the Lord. Turn to the Gospel of John, 14th chapter, verse 21 to 23. Gospel of John, 14th chapter, verse 21 to 23. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, going to repeat that, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. <clears throat> Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we, Father and Son, will come unto him and make our abode with him. 
So this is a stage in which the committed disciple goes from discipleship into preparing himself for the bride position. It is a decision that the individual makes based off of his love and desire for his Lord and Savior. Now what does this encompass in the individual's life when he makes this decision? Scripture teaches the bride member will have no desire for the things of this world. Turn to Philippians, the third chapter, verses 4 to 8. Philippians, the third chapter, verses 4 to 8. Paul speaks here about, comparatively speaking, what he had in this world as a, as a Pharisee, as an inheritor of wealth. He was born into wealth. He was born a Roman citizen. So he had a lot of things that people were envious of him. He says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews is touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, <clears throat> touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he had things that other people were envious of, they couldn't even expect to have. But one day, Paul had an encounter with the Lord Jesus on the Damascus Road. And that changed everything that he held in uh, what would be considered value. But what things were gained to me, I counted loss. For Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Now what is he saying here? Well, Paul is making a comparison. What is a comparison? that he's making. He's making a comparison of the things that this world offered him, things that people would give their right arm to have, things that were people were envious of him having, and he compared them to the things that he would receive in another world, another reality. And he compared the two. He sees another world, the things that he can have in this other world, and compares them to the things that he already has in this world, and he finds there's no comparison. He ditches everything that he had in this world and never looked back. He says, I count them but loss. I count them but dung. The word dung there is a word connoting something you would throw to a dog. So the bride member initially makes a decision that he has no stake in this world. This world offers him nothing. He could care less about the things of the earth it pertained to this life in the human race. Jesus himself said, the Son of Man hath not place to lay his head. 
wasn't interested in the things of this world. Notice what Paul goes on to say. Verse 9, To be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So he's talking about righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is living in right standing with God. Living in the approval of God. Paul was saying, I can't do it on my own. I don't have within me the things that would please God. But Jesus does. So I'm going to pursue the righteousness that is in Christ and appropriate that unto my own life. It's a decision that every Christian has to make. Are you going to live according to your own priorities or are you going to live according to God's priority? That's the determination between a believer, a disciple, and a bride member. To the level at which you determine you want to live righteously, that's the category that you're going to put yourself in. Then he goes on. <coughs> that I may know him. Know him. What does that mean? Have an intimate relationship with him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. <coughs> be made conformable unto his death. Paul makes a statement here. He says, in order to gain these things of the world that Christ comes from, I have got to experience the life that Christ is offering me in order to attain to the things that I'm desiring to attain to in that world. That includes the life that he lived. It includes the good things that he experienced, and it also includes, above all, the suffering that he experienced. Now, this puts the bride member in a unique position because to the human mind, you're not going to embrace suffering. You're going to try to avoid it at all costs. You're going to embrace those things that are pleasant. You're going to embrace those things that are comfortable. You're going to embrace those things that enable you to have an easy, enjoyable life. This is natural. You don't find people in general rejecting pleasure. You don't see people moving out of a mansion uh, <clears throat> to live in a homeless camp. It just doesn't work that way to human reasoning. But Paul says, I'm rejecting human reasoning I'm embracing that reasoning that can advance me in the world that Christ is offering me. And in that world, I see the life that he's experiencing, embracing things that are not very pleasant. Note what he goes on to say. That I may know him, experience him, relate to him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Paul makes a statement here. He says, I want to experience everything he experienced because Paul understood that there are two sides to every experience. There is a positive and it is a negative. He says, I want, to, I want to experience to the greatest that I can the sufferings that he experienced. Why? What in the world would anybody in his right mind want to embrace sufferings? Because Paul understood that there was a positive side to experiencing sufferings. There was a benefit there that most people would... would in no way come close to. Paul said, I not only want to come close to it, I want to embrace the fullness of it. Why? Because there's a positive aspect that I can gain from that experience. And in that respect, he says, I don't want to leave anything out. Whatever he, whatever he suffered, I want to suffer. Then he goes on. Why? He talks about that I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Paul understood a principle. 
the life you live here on earth is going to determine the ability of you to enjoy life in eternity. The level of the life of Christ that you experience here is going to enable you to experience the glories of Christ in eternity. His mind is not on this world. His mind is on the world of Christ. The Lord says, in this world, <clears throat> you don't identify. You identify with my world. Yes. Does the Holy Spirit always indicate to the person, to the saint, who has reached whatever level is necessary in their life to be a bright member, of course, whilst they're still on the earth? Does the Holy Spirit indicate that to them? Sure. At the point that they're still on the earth, still doing it? Sure. Hmm. Now, does he say, you are now a bright member? No. Or is there some other way no. of knowing it? No, he talks about in terms of commitment experiencing the life of Christ if you're going to experience the fullness of the life of Christ you're going to enter into that arena which puts you in the group of the bride but how does the Holy Spirit indicate that that person has achieved the goal that you just described oh you don't achieve it he doesn't indicate that you're going to achieve it he just lets you know that this is what you're doing correctly. Remember, the bride doesn't become the bride until eternity. The bride doesn't become the bride until everybody else has been glorified. Right, but I'm not talking about that. Mm -hmm. Because we know at least one person who's been told already that he is going to be the bride. That's what I'm talking about. Well, yeah, in that respect, the person will know. The Holy Spirit doesn't have to tell you. You okay. know. Okay, so the person just knows you know. in their own. Yeah. Paul never mentions bride here. No. But he knows okay. that this is what it takes right. to enter into that right. category. Mr. Smith. Okay, I want to admit something to the whole congregation here. I have been focusing my focus on becoming God's son, which I already am, but pleasing him with my efforts to be a joint heir with Christ, thus and so. Tonight, I understand it a little differently because, see, there's something inside of me that does not yet understand what it is to seek your betrothed. And I now desire that. So I want to thank you for tonight's lesson, Mr. Jones. What we find, the overall distinction with the bride member is his love for the bridegroom. In other words, the bride member reaches a point, and Paul is talking about this, where the only thing that matters in life, the only thing that matters in either temp uh, uh, the eternal um, um, glories that are offered to him is him being in and with his Lord him sharing that intimate relation with his Lord that's the only the most important thing to him and all everything else takes a lesser scale and we talked about the glories of the <coughs> elders, the glories of the bride, I mean the glories of the star group, the high potential of the pillar angels and the, 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 the mighty splendor that they're going to be given and they're going to exercise. But to the bride member, the only thing that really impresses him is being with his Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. Paul talks about this. That's why he says, I'm willing, wanting to embrace every aspect of his life to the degree that I can. If I could, I would want to experience the crucifixion as he experienced it. Why? Because he loved him so much. He wanted, he wanted to experience Jesus in 
in his fullness, as his entirety. He fell in love with the Lord on that Damascus road, sure. and he never looked back. He took whatever he had that everybody else valued, he stripped himself of it and threw it away and never regarded it ever again. He died in a prison uh, execution, uh, basically embracing the fullness of what he could experience in Christ's suffering. That's a bright number. Yeah. As he was executed, he was beheaded. So this is what we find Paul's mindset. Now we want to look at the other side of this. In eternity. Scripture teaches in eternity the saints who, compro who comprise the bride group will have bestowed upon them a garment of light that elevates them above all others. Revelation 19 verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So before the union takes place between the bride and the bridegroom, she is given this garment, this uh, garment of fine linen. And the word clean and white, it's actually in the Greek, it's clean and bright. She experiences a brightness, a glory. As you know, a marriage between the bride and the bridegroom, the, the bride's bridal gown is what sets her off. That's the, 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 the center of um, everybody. They look at the bride, and they look at how she's arrayed in her, her, her bridal gown, and uh, that sets the stage for the whole wedding. Yes. Okay, explain to me, because I'm not the sharpest pencil in the box. The, she's arrayed in the righteousness of saints. Mm -hmm. And what is the righteousness of saints? Well, your robe is your righteousness. It's called the robe of righteousness. But she's clothed in other saints is righteousness no it's talking about the group are all arrayed in this linen the linen robe is the righteousness of the group of the saints before she's arrayed in this robe she's arrayed in a white garment because she couldn't be there if she wasn't which is righteousness but this is talking about a and a, a high, higher degree of glory, which is a group array. Everybody, every member of this group sets them apart as a bride member. Whether they're in a group or whether it's in, in, in a single place, it's a designation that this, she is now the consort of the bridegroom. And hers is the, is the brightest, whitest robe of righteousness. I think yes, it's doing. just like the bride. You have bridesmaids mm -hmm. who are arrayed in beautiful you know, garments. The bride stands out because she's arrayed in something that sets her apart from everybody else. Yes. Mr. Jones, I'm trying to picture this. And she spoken as, a, as an individual is actually a compilation. Yeah, it's a group. <laughs> yes. It's a group. I know. And a group is marrying the group. Yes. Yes. There's a union between this group and the bridegroom. And this union makes them 
on an equal level with the bridegroom, which is what it is. And all marriage is is a union of two becoming one. So what they're saying here, the marriage, which is being witnessed by everybody, is this, first she's arrayed in this glowing, uh, glorious apparel, then the union takes place. What is the union? Go ahead. Okay. So they are a, an agreement of a union of what? Two becoming one. Okay. The two become one. Mm hmm So now Jesus is, is never going to be spoke of as Jesus. He's, or he is, he, is he? Sure. He never changes. The two become one because the bride is now elevated to the level of the bridegroom and then they un unify, they become one unit within the Godhead. He's taken out of the family and made part of God. We want to take a look at something that might make it a little clearer. What is it that makes the union? Said, it's not the garment, it's something else. I love him. You said it, the bride, is taken out of the family and into God. Yes. But the sons who are glorified at that point are the family. Yes, they are. Okay. But she's taken so, out of the position of sons. Right. So the point is that the, the bride is now in him. I'm using that language so you understand that it's, 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 it's the same one. Right? Yes. Right. Yes. So when you said they are now God, because two equals are joined and become one, the one started off as being God, mm -hmm. the other now equal being the bride is now God. The sons who are all of the angels, all of the elders, how are they described? How are they described? Yeah. Are they described as God since they are known as they, uh, so since, since they know as they are known? Or are they described as the Godhead? No. No, they're described as sons. Many sons. Sons. That's, that's the total. And the that, church of the, the firstborn okay. sons. Yes. <clears throat> so the two become one. Mm -hmm. The bride and the groom mm -hmm. become one. Yes. As in they become they they go they are in the Father. Mm hmm Yes. So there are they ever spoke of Second. Yes. Yes. Well when you get married, you can discern between the, the husband and his wife. But you know the husband and the wife are married. Uh, let me continue, let me make clear up a little bit. Second, I was gonna ask some question before I forget them all. So now because the two become one, is the son or the groom going to always be at the right hand of the father? Yes. So now he's got his betrothed, and she's now at the right hand of the father as well. No, she's within him. Within him, the father, the, or within he, him, the son? Within the, the son. She's, okay. she's part of the son, which is at the right hand of the father. Right. But she is the son Definitely. the counterpart to the son you can't separate them anymore sure. but you can't separate the son and the father anyway so but you have this addition okay yes we do don't we allow me to try to clarify this a little bit mm, we're watching it carefully okay and it may clear up a little something here <laughs> yeah. uh, we said that the unit the union does not take place when she is a given this apparel, the union takes place after she's arrayed in this glorious righteousness. What constitutes the union? I think this is the thing that may give us a little clearer comprehension. Scripture teaches that the marriage of the bride is an act <clears throat> that elevates her into a being of pure light she becomes a light emitter 
as <coughs> the Father and the Son are light emitters. Turn to Revelation 21, verses 9 to 11. And then came unto <clears throat> me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven plagues and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem. descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. That's the bride. Not the city, it's the light that's illuminating the city. You didn't explain that to Dara and Josie. Oh. <laughs> I wasn't talking about the bride. I was talking about the angel. But when you're reading, he says, he's going to show you the bride. And then he shows you the, the, the city. So, well, the bride has to be the city. I mean, you know, obviously. You, know. you didn't take the time to explain to them, Mr. Jones. So I'm just... I guess I'll have to watch the video. If they were here... They would, they would know. Amen. Amen. But let's go so on. <laughs> so we want to get his stab in. Everyone's got to get right. Absolutely. <laughs> so in the in the same uh, degree as we saw Revelation thirteen. No, Revelation one verse thirteen. I think I'm trying to say. We see what appears to be the Father described as a jasper stone. That's just where um, we're going to go. No, okay. So I'm sorry. No, 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 no problem. Down. That's We're, all right. Okay. You haven't written it down. Right? <laughs> you slipped it in. All right. All right. No, but my, my, my point was that you, you've now made it clear. That yes, that's the proof yeah. of the pudding. Revelation 4. Revelation 4. Verse 3. We said that the city... The, the, the New Jerusalem was like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Yes. The Father here is described the same way. Verse 3, he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in light like unto an emerald. So what we have is a far as a plurality, a prism of light colors. So is the sun, and so will the bride be. The bride is emanating light, just like the Father and the Son are emanating light, They're illuminating the right. creation. And if a person was standing looking at all three, mm -hmm. well, let me say looking at the bride and the groom, could anyone discern the difference between the Lord Elohim and his bride in terms of the brightness of this, these crystals? No. It looks exactly the Because same. they wouldn't be even. They wouldn't be equal. Right. If you so could it looks, it looks like one entity. Yes. yes. But will they know? Will who know? Those that we're talking about observing the Father, the Son, and the Bride. Only if, uh, only if the one they're observing chooses. Yeah. See, to, to know even as you're known, if somebody's choosing to allow that to happen. So now, right. That's interesting. Yes. Uh, understanding that now the bride has reached the pinnacle of the position in the Godhead, equality with the Son. So I've understood you to mean when he said, um, would they know only if he chooses? In the same way that only if a person seeks to comprehend, will they receive that comprehension? No, I'm saying only if God chooses to reveal the difference to the person. Oh, I see. Why would he reveal if they're trying to? Why would he reveal? Why would he reveal there's a difference between Elohim and the bride if they're joined? 
Oh, because there are times that are heaven. Turn to Revelation 22. There are times when you're going to see the difference. Because God chooses to oh, reveal really? it in that respect. Well, that's like saying uh, you get married, uh, you, your wife doesn't want to, you know, uh, uh, manifest her individuality that she's a wife. Right. You're going to know. Of course. Because she's choosing to reveal her. You know, you're still, an, you're still a distinct individual. You have been elevated to a status that goes beyond comprehension. And you're functioning in that status. But you're still, and it's still a group of saints. Would, would um, a person who has been limited to the new earth, looking at that vision that we're referring to, the Lord standing with his bride, mm -hmm. be able to determine? So this, this is someone who obviously didn't make right, didn't get anywhere, anywhere close. Would, would that person looking at the, the Lord and his bride be able to determine this? this these are two beings as one. No, that's the point that I was trying to make. Did Jacob know the YHVH wasn't God Almighty when he first met him? All you can see is a glory. And that's it. You can't, from the, the earth position, they don't have the ability to discern. So the Lord has to decide. I want to, you to reveal that to, to that person. Now, Revelation 22. <clears throat> I don't get a question. Oh, I didn't know you wanted to ask what that. You know, my arms, I, I, I'm getting buff hanging them. I'm waiting for acknowledgement. Okay, so did uh, Paul understand the difference between YHVH and the LH? Sure, he wrote about it. Immediately. Yep. On his road to Damascus, did he know? Oh, no, not immediately. Mm -hmm. no, but you know, as, as he progressed in revelation knowledge, yeah, sure. I okay. You just said the difference between white free age and that way. Yeah. Okay. Did Paul know on his road to Damascus, you know, that he's... I'm thinking working. because he's a, a doctor of the law and he's receiving comprehension passed down from the patriarchs, which he, that he must have received, why wouldn't he have known? Looking at it because he taught the law as a Pharisee. Are you saying the Pharisees now, don't know? No. Well, not that they, they don't know. No. They Look, know, they know that Christ is God, but they refuse to accept I'm not him. talking about that. I'm talking about the way they taught as a Pharisee. When Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount, when he got through, people's mouths dropped right. because he taught them differently. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. No, they didn't. But what you're, what you're describing is what they taught as opposed to You think the rabbis over in Israel know the difference? They don't know. They don't know. Do you think some of them know secretly? I'm just no. So they really they'll know. stone you if you even imply. <laughs> okay. Okay. I've always been the opinion that some of them know. No. And they just pretend. No. Be do Christians know? Christians don't know anything. They're the people that <laughs> they're, 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 on on a higher, they're on a higher. They're on a higher level. Christians are on the lowest level of knowing anything, anyway. Because they choose to be, <laughs> remain ignorant. But no, the rabbis, when you look at Genesis, the first, the first chapter, verse 26, it says, let us make man. Mm -hmm. They tell you this is God yes. talking to an angel. This is, this is what okay. Okay. No, they don't know. <laughs> the reason Paul and Abraham, I mean, uh, the reason Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew <laughs> was because of Melchizedek had a relationship with Elohim. Mm. And it took Jacob his whole life before he could really make the distinction. Yes. And he's on his deathbed talking to his sons. He says, well, the God that I met at Bethel, the angel that kept me all this time, so and so and so and so. Yeah, he knew then. Right. Is the implication that the scribes and the Pharisees do not recognize Melchizedek? They would um, recognize him in a certain way, a limited way, <clears throat> probably on an angelic level. Okay. But uh, they don't go too deeply into it because they don't have the Holy Spirit to give them comprehension. Uh, even Moses, Moses didn't know the difference for quite a while because he ran from God. You know, God told him, hey, come back here. So he's talking to the Father. 
But anyway, let's take a look here. You will distinguish between the bride making herself distinguished as a bride. Right. We see a scripture here. Verse 17, Revelation 22. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So the Holy Spirit makes himself known as an individual. The Son makes himself known as an individual. The Father makes himself known as an individual. The bride makes herself known as an individual. It depends upon the level of manifestation the recipient is on. Right, which is pretty much what we were talking about yesterday in terms of um, levels of individual being able to approach the throne determined by that level. Exactly. Exactly. The higher you are, the more comprehension you'll have. That's why Paul feverishly pursued revelation knowledge because he wanted all that was available to him. Unlike Christians today that delight in remaining ignorant of the scriptures. <laughs>